PPS Narayan, in addition to being the uh, Vice President of Engineering at Yahoo, is also an advocate for the Streaming Video Alliance. Now, the Streaming Video Alliance is an organization of more than 50 companies in the streaming media space, content providers, technology providers, other interested parties who are working together to uh, come uh, to arrive at some recommendations uh, and uh, best practices, perhaps even standards, uh, uh, for the online video industry. So PPS is going to talk about the future of OTT streaming, challenges and opportunities. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the intro. Um, I'll just give a brief overview and then we'll jump into the slides. My name is PPS Narayan. I run uh, video engineering at Yahoo. Um, many of you are probably consuming a lot of the content that Yahoo produces. Uh, we do a lot of uh, video on demand, news, finance, sports, highlights, uh, all kinds of things that you consume, as well as live events. And a lot of the uh, big scale live events that we have done, uh, you, you probably know of or have heard of, uh, things like the NFL. Uh, we did the Berkshire Hathaway annual shareholders meeting last month. Um, quite big scale events, global events. This is a presentation I gave uh, uh, about a month, a couple of months ago at the SVA Alliance, uh, the Streaming Video Alliance meeting that we hosted at Yahoo. And it's, a, it's, a, it's kind of a brief overview about what's happening in the market with ODT, what are the forces, and primarily being a technologist, I'm focusing on what are the technology shifts and how can we make uh, inroads into ODD streaming with the, with the kind of technological advances that we want to do. Uh, so let me just jump right into the slides. First, let's talk about the market forces and what are the things that are happening from a uh, consumer perspective and from a content provider perspective, the content owner perspective. So the, the number one thing that is happening is you, I think all of us would, or at least some of us here who are old enough would recognize, uh, this is how we used to consume TV uh, in, the, in the 1950s, 1960s, 1970s, and so on and so forth, until probably around 2000. And around 2000, uh, in, the, in, that, in that era is the first time we heard of this phrase called uh, cord cutters and online streaming. And, and online streaming, uh, became uh, more and more prevalent uh, services such as Netflix, Hulu, all these services started propping up. YouTube became prevalent as well. And people started consuming more and more video with the internet growing as well, right? And what has happened in, in, uh, since the 2000s, and we are now in the 2010s, is another interesting phenomenon. And I call this the what I call this is as not just the cutting of the card, but cutting of the social card as well, right? Where a lot of us are not consuming, we are consuming content together, but we are not consuming the same content. We are sitting in that couch, and there are multiple screens in front of us, and we are consuming content in a very different way, consuming videos in a very different way than what was happening before. So there is this uh, change in the consumption that is happening, which is driven by a, a, a different demographic, a different set of platform shifts, and a different set of technologies. And that's what is driving a lot of the uh, uh, changes that are happening with the consumers as well as the content providers. The consumers are becoming, uh, are consuming non-linear con uh, non content. They are consuming content socially inside the content, and they're discovering content socially as well, whereas, uh, content providers are taking this content and distributing it on multiple platforms, like you see here. They are distributing it in, uh, uh, disaggregating it from, and I I'll show a slide on that, about taking their content and pushing it in pieces across multiple platforms. And not only that, the content is going global as well. So who is driving this? This is being driven by the millennials or the age group between 18 to 34. And you'll see that the, the consumption of this age group is very different from what traditionally we have seen. We have seen that the millennials uh, co consume almost three times the amount of content online, that is video online, and they consume almost uh, two-thirds 
uh, or one third less from uh, live TV or TV uh, as we know it. And what is this leading to? Uh, what it, this is leading to is that there is a shift that is happening with pay television. We know that cable subscriptions and satellite television subscriptions are kind of going either flat or down. And what we have seen in the last five to six years is that there has been almost a 5% decrease in paid TV subscriptions that is happening in the US. And this, this has been accelerated by this demographic. And we see that very clearly. And this demographic is watching lesser and lesser uh, TV and moving their consumption of video to other platforms like uh, iPads, iPhones, connected devices, smart TVs, and so on and so forth. So this is the big shift that is happening, and we all probably know about that. The other interesting shift that is happening is newer forms of content, newer forms of, uh, of, of video and, uh, and, and, and types, of, types of events that people want to see have changed. What you see is, typically when you see, the, uh, when you see the Super Bowl or the MLB World Series, these are huge TV events. The Super Bowl sees like 100 million viewers on an average uh, across, across all the devices that, that people watch the Super Bowl on. For example, the MLB World Series sees like 15 million viewers on TV on a, game, on a, on a, on a per game basis. The NCAA, uh, uh, NCAA basketball March Madness, you see that that are about 15 plus million viewers watching that. The NBA Finals, I'm a big NBA fan. I watch the playoffs, uh, great fun. 25 million plus viewers watching uh, NBA uh, playoffs and finals. But there is this new form of uh, entertainment which is called as eSports, which is basically gaming, taking gaming to a new level, become, making it competitive, which has grown, uh, grown massively. And you'll see that, for, for example, the League of Legends, that happened uh, last year, we saw 32 million viewers for that event. In fact, they had a stadium, the Staples Center, which was completely sold out for that event, and there were eight million concurrent viewers watching it online as well. And this was also telecast on things like ESPN. So there's a new set of uh, content that people are, uh, are, are wanting to consume, and this is driven by the millennials as well. As I was saying, uh, the, content pro, uh, the content owners are seeing the shift. Cable providers are sh seeing the shift. The people who are owning the content now want to distribute the content on multiple, multiple platforms. HBO decided that they wanted to take their, their channels and take it on OTT and, and build a service called as HBO Go, uh, HBO Now, and then uh, people like ESPN, they, they advertise regularly saying, Come watch ESPN on, your, on, the, on, on the app. You'll get exactly what is shown on TV at this time. Um, bunch, of, bunch of content that has been disaggregated and distributed via apps across the board. Very interesting phenomenon, right? But this produces challenges for the consumer. Now the consumer has to go and discover it. And that's where all these technology challenges come in. So to recap, oh, sorry, uh, to recap, uh, there, is, there is a consumer shift, cord cutting, nonlinear consumption, uh, social discovery and social viewing. And there is a content shift that is happening that is basically the disaggregation of content, people taking the content to various platforms, making them as part of subscription bundles, uh, and then also taking it global. Right? Netflix announced that they are going to have uh, their service available at 130 countries. Uh, last quarter. So the content is no longer uh, is not no longer just available locally. So what is how can how, how is this shift helping drive the technology and how is technology driving this shift and that's what we'll uh, look at very briefly. So from a, a technology perspective I see a bunch of challenges and how do we make those challenges accelerate the shift. The technology challenges we see are, number one, do we have TV-like quality? And we'll talk a little bit about that. What does that mean? What is it that consumers want, and how do we give that quality to them? Second is, we are, 
gone from the age where we use our uh, index finger just to press buttons on the remote to actually interact and immerse ourselves with the content, right? We are in a, in, a, in a space where now we have iPads, iPhones, people can actually go and tap and interact with the content. And some of the immersive experiences I'll talk about. Then as, we, as this content is disaggregated, there is an issue with content discovery. How do we discover this content? How do we consume this content? How do we make this content more appealing to our new demographics that are consuming it? And then finally, obviously, there are problems with scale. Okay, so let's first talk about uh, TV-like quality. Uh, we streamed at Yahoo the game on October 25th on um, uh, uh, NFL game between uh, Jacksonville Jaguars and the Buffalo Bills. We had extremely good quality from, the, from what we heard from our viewers. Our numbers were great. Our QS numbers were below 1% rebuffering, and we thought fantastic, right? But then as you close, uh, look, start looking closely at these numbers and what is happening, you'll see that we are still not at TV-like quality. And what does that mean? Uh, the resolution. For example, most of the content that comes into stream is at 720p. It's still not at 1080p. So forget 4K. 4K is still far away. We, we are still getting content in at, 10, uh, at, at 720p, and very little content is being produced at 1080p. The second is bandwidth. Across the board, you will see that uh, bandwidth is a huge constraint. If we want to go to 1080p, we are roughly talking about six to eight megabits per second for a user to be able to consume that, uh, consume that content at that resolution. At 4K, it becomes like 20 megabits per second, right? So bandwidth is still not caught up. Imagine 100 million viewers coming and watching the Super Bowl on their iPads. I mean, it's not going to happen, right? It's going to melt down the internet. We are not going to be able to serve them at any reasonable quality. In, in addition to that, a lot of protocol evolutions are happening. People are trying to address things like working on lossy mobile networks. You are on a Wi-Fi, you are on LTE, or even, uh, uh, even on edge in certain parts of the world. Your network is really, really bad, and you have to deliver content at very high quality. So some new protocols are evolving. ISPs, Comcast, bunch of folks in, in the market, uh, Verizon, a lot of people are debating, should we use multicast as a way of distributing this content efficiently across our network in such a way that we don't consume too much of bandwidth? And then metrics, right? Metrics are a huge issue in, in, in OTT streaming. We focus on this number called as rebuffering. I don't know how many of you know what rebuffering means. Uh, show of hands, everybody knows what rebuffering is. Uh, at least 50% do. So rebuffering is when you see the spinner and people are waiting for content to be downloaded. The number that people report is what percentage of time they see rebuffering across their whole audience. So for example, at Yahoo, we see 0.4 to 0.5% rebuffering in the US. What does that mean? That means that if, a user, if all our users watch for 200 seconds, they see one second spin. Now, on TV, you never see the spin. Right? So rather than focusing on whether we get a one second spin for 200 seconds of viewing across all our users, wouldn't it be better to show one user 200 seconds of spin, right? which would make 99% of our users have extremely flawless quality, right? Right? It's, 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 TVs, in TV, you don't measure it this way. right? You get extremely good quality. Uh, not only that, we have things like frames per second drop. Um, you know, your bitrate keeps changing. When you are actually watching the uh, video, you are suddenly seeing blocks and pixelation. Never see it on TV. Need to get much better at that. Uh, ads. This is a, a really funny uh, uh, also set of problems because in TV, when, you, when, when, when it switches from content to ads, it's absolutely seamless. You, you see a, a half a second. 500 to 200 millisecond black slate, and then boom, it moves to the ad. On, on uh, most of the streaming uh, platforms today on the internet, you'll see that there is a spinner that happens. It waits for four to five seconds. It moves from ad to ad. Sometimes it doesn't allow, sometimes it allows you to skip. Sometimes it doesn't allow you to skip. Bunch of problems. You make it seamless. You need to have really good technology to solve these problems. 
Not only that, if you have 100 million viewers coming and watching, uh, watching the Super Bowl, our, none of the ad systems in the world today can support dynamic serving of ads to 100 million users exactly at the same time if you're doing a live event, right? So these are the kind of scale problems that you'll hit. And then finally, there is a bunch of problems with latency. So with latency, what happens is today, when you use your TV, you click on a, on a, on a channel change, it like almost in 500 milliseconds instantaneously it appears. In, on the internet, you click on a link or click on a video, it takes two, three, four, five seconds to appear. Not only that, there's another interesting phenomenon. In, 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 in the internet, because of the protocols that we use to transport video, you see 20 to 30 second delay from when the broadcast has happened, okay? And this 20 to second delay, uh, 30 second delay, interestingly, is different for every user. So I would be sitting in, the, in a bar today watching TV. You have three televisions watching, showing you the show, uh, showing you the game. Everybody cheers, claps at the same time. Whereas when you get into ODD streaming, every TV is going to be at a different uh, 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 different stage in the, in the game, it's going to be four, five, 10 seconds off, you're going to have a very bad experience, okay? So these are the kind of problems that we have where we are still not TV-like. And there are a lot of challenges that we have to uh, overcome to come to this. None of these challenges are very difficult. Many of the things that we do at Yahoo is, for example, getting better at bitrate adaptation, making ads seamless, you know, making, making the quality better and better. But we have a way to go. Then I want to talk briefly about the immersive experiences. I talked about using our index finger now to actually interact. Um, there are three types of immersive experiences, roughly. There is one with time. Like you have a, you have a DVR at home. You can go record your uh, show. You can like scrub back. You can do a bunch of things. Those are the kind of experiences we are trying to bring to OTT as well. A right? bunch of people can uh, provide something called as cloud DVR. Then you can do live scrubbing. Another interesting problem is as people are interacting with, with live, live streams uh, on, on, on their uh, OTT devices, you show up, for example, in the NBA playoff in the second quarter. The score is about 35 to 40. You don't know how the score ha reached 35 to 40. Now, what you do is you wait till halftime. You wait for somebody two talking heads to come talk about this game, give you the highlights, tell you who scored, what happened. Now imagine, because now you're on an OTT device, you can actually scrub and watch highlights real time, right? And that's something that we are trying to do with, for example, with eSports, where you're watching a game, there are a bunch of people interacting with the game, uh, uh, chatting about it, and then as you go to the scrubber, you can actually go and look at some highlight points along the scrubber. Okay? And then as the, as the user wants to watch some highlight, you actually take the live, move it into a picture-in-picture into picture mode, and then look at, uh, watch the highlight, and then you can come back to the, to the, uh, to the live to the live as well, right? So, so this is kind of the experience that you can bring to audiences on these new platforms. And interestingly, this does not scale if if you decide to do this on a game-by-game, real-time basis. So what we are doing is we are actually using machine learning algorithms to actually train models that can real-time take the frames, look at the frames, understand whether it was a kill, it was a hit, it was a basket, it was a goal, and then drive these highlight points automatically, okay? So that's, that's what I think the time-based uh, time -based immersive experiences mean. The second is uh, in space, and this is the interesting talk we had this morning. There are a lot of people that are, uh, I don't know how many of you attended the keynote this morning. Uh, there's a lot of talk about multi-cameras, 360 views, about AR, VR. Uh, these are the experiences. This is still a bit nascent in the sense that if you attended the keynote, you'll hear a lot of technical challenges to solve this problem, right? Uh, won't talk about this too much, but there's another Another interesting immersive experience, this is with content and with people. And this is about the social discovery, right? As you're watching a game, as you're watching a, a video, you want to interact with other people socially inside the video. 
and interact with the content with the video. So interesting uh, uh, things that are happening here is uh, if you look at Facebook Live and if you look at Yahoo when we do these live eSport games or eSport events, uh, we allow people to chat. You kind of are interacting and chatting with people. You can actually take snippets, animated GIFs, share it with people on other social media, and bring that sharing and uh, combined social experiences together. Another, uh, I don't know how many of you use Amazon Prime. Uh, I'm, I use Amazon Prime. I think they have done a fantastic job with this um, feature known as X-Ray, and I'll show you a clip of that. I think that's a mind-blowing experience, and uh, we'll look at that as well. This is basically you going and interacting with the content, and we'll look at that. So now, now that the content is, content is now disaggregated, now you can interact with content. How do, we, how, do we, how do we get a better understanding and discovery of the content, right? So one thing is, if you, uh, I was mentioning about X-Ray. X-Ray is when you are on Amazon Prime and you tap on the, on, the, on the screen. It brings out all the content that is related to that frame, to that screen. Who are the actors? What is the background music? Who uh, composed the background music? Any other trivia that is there with the, with the content? And, and it's pretty amazing. You can actually go and start interacting with the content. And that's the kind of experience that we need to bring to all our content. And how they do it, I, I believe they were initially doing it mechanically. But at scale, now you have to do this for all content, and you do have to do it for real time. It becomes very, very challenging. The second is, well, with TV, you didn't have a mechanism of actually real time getting sentiments from, from people. Now you can actually look at things like what is happening on chat, what's happening on the audio, what is happening in closed captioning. I can use all of that, con all of the associated data around the video to give a better experience. Like for example, you tell Siri, go and show me the uh, scene where Jack Nicholson says, uh, uh, you know, you can't handle the truth. And Automatically, you have a mechanism of going into the closed captioning, going into the audio, and actually going and seeking to the point where that audio snippet happened, right? And that's, that's the kind of indexing, that's the kind of tagging, understanding of the data that you need to do. In addition to this, this is another mind-blowing experience that if you really want to get to know the content in a way that is personalized. Imagine I have a Yahoo um, a fantasy sport team. I'm playing fantasy sports with my, with my buddies. I have an NFL team. Uh, I'm, I'm choosing players. Now, as I'm watching, say, something like NFL Red Zone, I don't know how many of you watch it, you can go and pick the snippets, the starts, the highlights of your players rather than just take generic games and watch it. Right? So you can actually look at this frame, look at the player, figure out who are the players in that frame, and bring that to your audience in an in a interactive fashion. And this is another thing that we are also looking at is how do you take computer vision and look at content, look at entities in the content, and tag them in such a way that you can then bring that in a customized way to the audience. And then finally, we talked about all this distribution of content that has happened because of the unbundling. This unbundling means that users don't know where to go and watch the content, right? They don't know that a show is available on HBO or a movie is available on Xfinity on demand or uh, uh, something is available on Showtime on their phones. So you want to be the index, the aggregator of that, dis of that discovery. And that's what at Yahoo we have built a product called as Video Guide where you can go and discover content across all the services that you have on your on your device. So that's another interesting uh, personalization that we can bring to our audience. And then this is my final couple of slides. Uh, we all know that video consumption, video um, is, is global. It's not a US phenomenon. Uh, countries like um, India and China, huge amount of video consumption. In India, for example, one of the fastest growing uh, internet, uh, internet uh, audiences is in India. It's growing directly on mobile, on internet, on smartphones at 100 million plus a year in the next couple of years. 
these kind of uh, new audiences coming in, they're going to consume a lot of video. And to be honest with you, this is a Cisco uh, uh, index. I don't believe these numbers. These numbers are too low in my opinion. Because from what I have seen at Yahoo, these numbers are going to be just blown away. So this growth is not uh, indicative of the capacity, the bandwidth, the scale, the problems that we are going to have in distributing our content uh, across the world. And the interesting thing is, just this year, in the start of this year, Netflix has announced that they are at 130 countries, and Facebook announced a live product where everybody's streaming live content and people can come and consume it across the world. So very interesting set of problems. So just to recap, you know, we have a consumer shift, we have a content provider shift, and as technologists, you know, we have the ability to actually accelerate the shift and build the right technologies, bring the right kind of um, innovations that we can then help consumers consume content in this new medium. Thank you. <laughs>